Hello and welcome back to another episode. Today's guest is Natasha. She is a seven-figure business mentor, speaker, and tech founder. She's all about infusing untraditional marketing, sales psychology, and laughter into every aspect of business. I'm so excited for you to listen to this episode. Let's dive right in. Hello, I have Tosh here with me and I am so excited. I was like, okay, I need to pull up my notes. What are we gonna talk about? And then I was like, wait a second, I don't need to do that. Like I know Tosh and the conversation is just gonna flow and just give you a little backstory for anyone who's listening. I, this is actually like a, I don't even know what the word would be. Uh, for this would be. Yeah. yeah, yeah. A journey to this moment and the future. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Yes, quite the journey. I'm trying to think of like when exactly this happened. I think it was in 2021. And you can correct me on because you would probably know dates. But I came across Tasha's Instagram account. And she was selling what was your ebook thing that you were selling? What was yeah, that? that was probably 2020 and the Instagram kit. Okay, it was the Instagram kit. I came across her Instagram account. And literally up until the day that I joined her mastermind, which was beginning of 2023, I actually had the sales page for the Instagram kit in like my Safari tabs. No joke. Like this is, I'm not even kidding. And so I came across the Instagram kit and I was just like so freaking inspired by the Instagram kit. And it was like one of those things where I didn't invest in it, but I was like, so invested in it at the same time, if that makes sense. I, again, I had that literally on my Safari tabs for years after I found it, but I don't think I ever followed you on Instagram. Maybe I like unfollowed you in a cleanse. I don't know. Don't take it personally. I absolutely love you and I'm following you now. So anyways, though, I came across Tosh again at the beginning. I think it was January, 2023, like one of the very first few days of January. And it was Erin May Henry who was posting that she had just joined a mastermind with this girl. And I was like, why is she so excited about joining this mastermind with this person? And I tapped on who she tagged and it was Tosh. And I was like, what the heck? Full circle moment. And so I, I think I found you and within 24 hours, I was inside the mastermind, which is, yeah that just goes to say how amazing you are as sales and marketing, which we're going to dive into in this podcast. But I just had to give the background story. I feel like we have had a quite the journey. So I joined the mastermind in 2023 and it was that four, four month mastermind, literally life changing, business changing so many different ways. And we've just stayed connected. And now Tosh is coming in as a speaker for the Profit Maven Summit that's happening in October. And I'm so excited. I'm just the universe just needed us, wanted us to connect. And I'm so excited to have you on the podcast, Tosh. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you. I know. I love our little love story, our little business yeah. love story. <laughs> it's so amazing. Um, but no, and it's, it's to, yeah, we're going to be going all into sales psych and it's exciting because that's what I'll be talking about at your amazing summit. So I'm super thrilled. The fact that we had to hug in person that we get to be there in person and everyone who's listening to this podcast has the opportunity to be there too and we can just oh my gosh there's just something about meeting people in real life it's just the best and i also i don't know why this is coming to my mind right now but the fact that you messaged me and you're like how tall are you because i might freak out i was like oh my gosh that's so true because i feel like on instagram you never know how tall people are Oh, it will like catastrophically disrupt my entire day, my to-do list out the freaking window. If I have a vision and I'm like, oh, like you're giving like five, eight and you're like, yeah, I'm like a five, one distraught. Or if I met you when you were just like a tall giant, I'd be like, wait, what? So I was like, I need a prep for the nervous system. I got to know because I have it in my mind and thank God I was pretty spot on. So we're good. Yes. I think you said like five, five and I was like, yeah, I'm five, six. So all as no. well, that one inch did not disrupt anything. <laughs> okay. But all that being said though, let's dive into the juiciness, starting yep. off with your story because your story is hecka inspiring. I want all of the deeds. Give us, how did you get started? Yeah. So I started when I was 21. That feels like decades and decades ago. I'm 27. Um, but I started in 2019 and it all started from a simple favor. I had no business starting a business. Um, I was just about to walk the stage graduating the University of Ottawa with comms and business. And I, at the time, so I live in the capital of Canada, which is, um, 
it's like a government town. It's the Ottawa dream I like to call is securing a government job. And I had that for four years. So everyone, all my peers, my university friends, my family, all that, they were like, wow, like you really have solidified your career path. And I was like, yeah, she's cute. It's been great during university. But as I got to my fourth year and I was like, okay, we got to put our big girl panties on. We got to, you know what I mean? We got to get out into the world, build your actual career. I had that moment, that, that crisis of wait, what the hell am I doing? I don't think I want to be here. I want to go home. I'm not feeling fulfilled. And then I was granted and given a contract, which at the time it was mind blowing money. And it still is in so many ways, a $61,000 salary fresh out of university, right? Like full-time contract at the most sought out department, Global Affairs Canada. So what should have been the biggest celebration ever, I I like went home and sobbed. I'm like, what am I doing? I don't want to do this. I felt so lost. But that transpired into me creating a website for myself. And I was trying to find consulting jobs. I wanted to do something way more interactive. And so Mm -hmm. my friend, Jen, who owns a really successful clinic, she saw that and she was like, wait, Tash, can you make my website? Um, Mm -hmm. And I said, sure. And so she had a great platform. She has an amazing business. She was years in it at that time. And once it went live, oh my gosh, the referrals came flowing in. And so long story short, the first month I hit 10K, the second month I hit 10K, third month I hit 10K, and then I quit and went full-time like that. And it was solely because that one favor, and I literally turned that, my, my personal website into a business overnight. And I was just like, we're doing it. And then it turned into an agency. So I started you know, out as a digital marketing expert and designer. Designing was my main thing. And then that transpired into business coaching and speaking, and then now tech founder. So it's been quite the journey, three three businesses, no more designing, but I'm still doing business mentoring and speaking, obviously, and tech founder. So Azura, the app. Okay. Can you give us a little more deets on Azura? Because everyone needs it. And yeah. it's linked down in the show notes right now. Go check it out and you need it in your life right now. ASAP, download it or else I'm coming for you. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, why you kill me? Yeah, Azura. So we all know, I can't say we all love necessarily the communication apps we use. So the Voxers, right? The Slacks, the Telegram. Yeah. They're cute. They do the job. But I had a moment and I was like, what the heck are we doing here? Because these apps were not designed for us for the unique work that we do. And we work so hard and spend so much money on building our brands, our personal, our visuals, right? Your website, your social media assets. And where we actually deliver these quote unquote luxury services, these apps couldn't clash more with our brands, if even yeah. if they tried. Zura is a female-led communication app built for service providers, creatives, entrepreneurs. And it was designed by entrepreneurs, service providers, creatives. I had so many hands in the pot, but it's really filling that communication gap. And yeah, that's Azura. She's live and we launched her in January. And it's been such a success. I think if I was to re- refresh right now, we're at 1400 already, which is like... Mind, we're not even in the app store just yet. We're about to be like right around the corner a week or two. No ads just yet, all organic still. So, very fulfilling. It is the best platform. I'm running my program scalability in it, which starts next week and is the best. So organized for my little organized brain, especially it's great for all things communication. But I would say for me, like the biggest breath of fresh air that it's been is like big groups of people and like having more organized communication because I don't know about you, but if you're a Voxer and a mastermind and you plug into that, it's just like hecka overwhelming. And also the AI summary that you get, I'm like jaw on the floor, literally the best feature in my opinion, especially for big groups. So if you haven't checked it out, go check it out. It's in the show notes. But something that was coming to my mind as I was listening to you talk about your story, which I love hearing, I've heard it a bunch of times. So every time I hear it, I'm like, ooh, there's like little bits and pieces where I'm like, ooh, I want to know a little bit more about this. So on your journey, all these different businesses that you've created, they were created from a need. Even the app was created from like a need that you saw and the website design, all of that was created from a need 
For someone who is wanting to jump into being an entrepreneur, how do, I feel like so many people have a hard time finding that need. And I think that's a huge reason why a lot of people have issues, not necessarily issues, but they struggle a little bit on the front end of getting that momentum started for their business because they didn't create from a need. Can you talk a little bit more about that? I love, I love that point. That is so true. And that's honestly something I've been very firm on in my business is truly creating from a space of experience. You can relate to the failures, the not so sexy things, the amazing things, the cheat codes, the hacks, and truly like you really, yeah, you can learn that from someone else, but you get to create a new path, new strategies, methodologies, because you actually have tangible results to speak from. So yeah, when I started out designing, that was definitely like, I just got thrown into the wolves there. I was like, we're going to do it. And it all worked out. But how I quickly within three months got into the digital marketing was people were asking, how are you scaling so quickly? What's going on? How are showing up on Instagram? And that was all the rage in 2019, truly yeah. like the Instagram. It still is so big, but like ebooks specifically and all that. And so people were asking continuously in the DMs, how do you do this? How are you showing up? And so I made an ebook and then, yeah, to, to really like tap into how to listen to your people and create from a need is genuine, authentic relationships. And because I sit there and I actively listen to my people and it's from those little mundane chit chats. It's from those personable relationships where they feel comfortable to open up and be like, oh my gosh, I relate to that too. Or, oh, this frustrates me as well. You create space for open dialogue constantly. And so down to people feeling safe to be like, Hey, what the heck's going on? I want to know about the Insta Instagram kit. And then business mentorship too. I, I saw everyone and myself included was in this omnipresent era in 2021, still to this day too, but it was a huge push all the rage. And so I listened to my people when I was like, okay, people are burning out like crazy that push yeah. after COVID. And then once things opened up, there was a massive fatigue and a lot of people didn't make it through that hump after. And so yeah. I was like, sustainably scaling. So I really, Really, I just listen to people. And if you take a moment to like tap in, okay, what are the trends and what might occur after this trend? What might not be the sexy aspect that comes out of this and, and down to the app too. And it's really just like going through the ebbs and flows and experiences. And again, like listening to your people, having that two-way collaboration, because that's where I've opened up a Google doc or just started collecting the most messy, raw type of market research. And yeah, it formed into some of my um, greatest creations and things that I'm the most proud of and the most, yeah, success-filled projects to date. I love that so much. And as I was listening to you talk about like listening to other people, I feel like that's a huge part of sales and why you were so massively successful with like your marketing and all that. Can you talk a little bit more about how listening affects marketing, whether you want to dive into like buyer types or anything like that, but just building off of that topic. Yeah. One of the biggest things is, so in sales psychology, it's the power of silence and sales. We oftentimes, and we're all guilty of this. So no tea, no shade if you do this, but where say someone is talking to you and you immediately jump to, oh my God, I went through that experience too. And here's the story. And it's, it's not a fault. It's just how humans naturally try to connect. Now that's in a personable level that tends to occur very frequently. And so sometimes it's when you like flip the script and yes, you are quote unquote making the story about you. And that is acceptable in a lot of ways, but in sales that is replicated often. And that's what you do not want to do. I think, and that comes down to active listening, which relates to the method of silence and sales. What do I mean by this? So say you're having an authentic conversation in the DMS or you're, you are on a sales call instead of doing that natural jerk to which i know the intention is to make them feel seen and you can relate to them yeah actively listen and start asking like probing questions dive a little deeper because and repeat so it's also called the mirror effect be like okay so what i'm getting from that is you're feeling xyz and what you're really ultimately craving is this and it's they're going to walk away and be like oh my gosh that was a breath of fresh air did we just have a therapy session did we did i just get a best friend and it creates you made it about them, not you. And yes, you can have little moments to relate to them, but the core foundation of that is the active listening piece. And sales psychology and buyer psych 
it becomes second nature. It becomes so natural. But at first it is that little gut check of, am I slipping into a habit of say, making the story about me or going on a tangent about, you know, trying to make them feel safe and seen. And so, yeah, I think that's a few little methods to apply to have active listening. And I think the biggest thing is just ask questions to your people really take in what they're saying and almost deconstruct it back to them. Because oftentimes in sales too, when you do that, you're going to notice that if objections come up, they actually aren't fully aware of the objection and you're going to get to the actual deep root of it. And it, you're what you're doing is setting the tone for a beautiful partnership and connection, say if it's in a live offer or private, and you're going to make your people feel amazing. And that's the whole goal, right? I love that so much. And this is 100%. You're someone who talks the talk and walks the walk all of the way. And I keep thinking about your launch for the app. Do you, maybe, maybe this is probably like second nature for you at this point, but could you walk us through what was your thought process during that launch? Because it was massively successful and there was so much sales psych that was like infused into all that, including like, Even exactly what you were just saying, where people would comment and you'd be like, hey, I'm going to send you a voice memo. And like you were listening to them. You were making that like communication very personalized, which made them feel like they were a part of your community. And that's just one of the things that you did. But can you walk us through some of the sales psychology tactics and methods that you use during that launch to make it so successful? Yeah, hundred percent. And thank you. Your case study was that, that made my whole, it still makes my day. I go back and watch it. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> love that. My girl, Maya. But oh, yeah. girl, that's all you. You're amazing. Oh, thank you. But yeah, Azura, some of the methods, one, it was definitely the, the connection, just like actually making them feel seen and heard. And I think, I don't think I know this from mentoring so many students now, with launching and it's, I I see it. People are like, Oh, I don't want to do the engaging part. Or I don't like, can I just, can it just be all automation? And in some capacities, yes. And when you're scaling, of course, like you can't be on your phone 24 seven, but schedule in time to really connect and make your people feel something. Not only is that going to get them in the back end actually talking with you, but it does build an amazing rapport. And that is and on the front facing marketing, people seeing you engaging. There's actually a face and a human being behind the name, especially as you, you grow big and you have those vanity metrics on your side, it can create almost this disconnect to like human being business. And so when you allow yourself to really connect and on the front facing, say in the comments and tagging people. Again, it facilitates a really beautiful energy, but some of the psych methods, one curiosity. So that was a really big one. Curiosity is a huge form of sales psychology. And I'm so guilty. Like I'm like an open book. Like I love to, I think of something I'm like, I got to share it with my people right away. But because things were done, like it's a very different type of project. It's not like a program where you can think it and create it within a week or two. This was like a year in the making and or months and months in the making. So when it came time, things were ready, we're good to go months in advance. I had everything I could post, but I started to build curiosity where I, on the back end, if you got into the wait list, that was a big portion. I got people to funnel on the back end and that's where I started to really give the juice, the what are the facts. It felt like an exclusive space to be and that is building expressive buyers, which was very intentional. But on the front facing, I almost left people, and this is something I'm very firm on, confusion is the number one conversion killer. You do not want to confuse your people. So there's a subtle art of confusion versus curiosity. And so I wanted Mm. people to know it was going to be Azura and it was going to be a communication app. All the yeah. sexy things, all the, what it's actually the nitty gritty features and how it's going to change your life and when, and all these details weren't very clearly, boldly put on socials. It's yeah. like a breadcrumb here and there. And so curiosity, cause it was like, okay, if you want on, you have to go onto the wait list. And that grew so much. And again, organic, and I don't have a crazy amount of followers. I'm under 10K, but I had, yeah, I had an incredible number on the wait list and people kept building and building because the curiosity was peaked. And so it was, and I dropped 
the sales psychology as well too was again expressive buyers so if you showed up and you were there early you got the holiday sale before christmas so you got 60 percent off and then i dropped it to the pre the waitlist sale which was 50 percent off and so there was a lot of incentives and then yeah with that like the mere exposure effect as well too like really building familiarity so through the marketing and talking about our common enemy if you want to say right the voxers the slacks the things that all irk us and our deepest aspirations in terms of how to really show up and serve our people. I really poked at that. And so it was just like, okay, I see you, you see me, like we're in this kumbaya together. Let's jump in. That was a big portion as well. And there's so many other things, but I would definitely say expressive buyers too. I'm very strategic to facilitate Expressive buyers, there's four buyer types, but expressive buyers are like your ride or die. They are going to do the work for you. They're going to like their grandma, their neighbor, their dog knows about you. They're like, this is the bee's knees. You got to get on, you got to get in on this. And I did that through again, the connections behind the scenes, talking with them, really giving them truly like exclusive information, deals, discounts, making them feel special and seen. That's That was a big one. And then quickly too, I know we talked about this in the mastermind, like the shareholder effect, self-actualization. This is the hierarchy of needs. And so what I did was I made it, and that was the year journey that you saw in the highlight of the app behind the scenes. I made people like genuinely, we built this together, the app. And it was not, I did not, even down to the visuals, I was like, I do not want to be the front and center. You guys helped me name it. They helped me create so many aspects, like down to even now with the feature roadmap, like Azure is great because of you, because of everyone and your opinion matters. And not only did you share it, but we showed that it was like live in action. And so yeah. that was a big one. That was a big little tangent on that, but there's so many aspects I did, but yeah, I'd say those are the core components. I love that. You mentioned expressive buyers, which I am hands down. I better be your number one. <laughs> buyer. <laughs> that is me. I am your expressive buyer. But for those listening who have zero idea what the heck buyer types are, can you just give like a brief overview of yeah. those four different buyer types that you mentioned? Let's do it. So for example, if they're analyzing your audience, you have expressive buyers. Like you are a great representation of an expressive filled audience. So expressive buyers are like my one true love. And seriously, for an analogy, I always say this expressive buyers is like the love languages of sales. And so you can, depending on what you're purchasing, who it is, what the price tag, it can switch. Like you can go in between different buyer types, but you do have a very prominent one. And so expressive buyers is it's the, they deeply care about the relationship towards the person and thing that they're investing in. They want to be the star client. They're the one who is going to show up. They want to be first on the list. You're likely going to have an amazing relationship and they're going to express a lot of admiration towards you, your successes. They're going to know your story again, like their husband, their wife, their bestie, their grandma. Everyone's going to know about you because they're just screaming from the rooftops. They're your returning clients. It's a beautiful energy to have. And it is what creates phenomenal engagement. It's what creates your community to engage together as well. And you do a great job as at that. And it's every time I post to you, people are like, oh my God, Maya, love her. She's so incredible. Um, her community is so phenomenal. Or you guys are my two favorite peeps together. And we both have a very expressive audience. And so that's expressive. And how to pick up on it. Like again, do a deep dive on Maya's socials. Like you will see that level engagement. You will see the words of affirmations. You will see the like pure sheer love that people have for Maya. That's expressive. And then you have analytical and the, the analytical buyers, they get a lot of, they don't have a good rep. Like people get very frustrated, but these are the ones that you got to take a little bit more time with. And once you understand buyer psych, you become so much more patient and understanding with sales and you honestly disconnect and you don't take it as personal and analytical buyers are like the root to that because they tend to be a little bit more cold. They super risk avoidant. Like they do not want to take a risk. They need the sales page. They need, so if people state that you need to only sell the benefits and the flashy things that couldn't be further from the truth because analytical buyers need the features. They don't want the flashy things. They want the black and white one, two, three, what are the call times when they need that to feel safe within in the purchase and to reduce the pain and get the pleasure. So 
analytical. They need to analyze the information on their own time. They cannot feel pressured. They do not want to feel sold to. So it is the power and the follow-up. It's giving them the space and capacity and information needed to make the decision on their own time. And then you let them lead. And it's so funny. I, yeah. Uh, I don't know if you're going to say this, but I have to interject in the mastermind, Alyssa, and she's at Inspired Media Co. She has another podcast. She, she has an episode with me on the podcast, which was also amazing. Go listen to that. And she's also going to be another, she's one of the other speakers at the summit too. So just like, we're all just connected and I love it so much. And I was introduced to her because of the mastermind, but she is an analytical girly and we just teased her the entire mastermind <laughs> because of it. But anyways, I just had to put that in there. <laughs> yeah. And I was going to say, it's a running joke that I will turn my strongest analytical bias into expressive ones because Alyssa, it took her two years to invest, but we were, we, oh my God, we would kiki in the DMs. We were besties laughing, right? But she stalked me. She's like, oh no, like uh, I was like shamelessly, I was stalking you left and center. Oh, you put a link out? It is saved on my tab and I am going through it, reading it like a book. That was me too. That was me too for you as well. I had never really thought about that. But now that I'm like listening to you speak, I'm like, that was me. I literally had your ebook on my tabs for three years thinking about it. And then the the details is what got me into the mastermind. And now I'm an expressive buyer. So that was totally me. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's just interesting. And so analytical and Alyssa, like she, you would think she's super, she is expressive. She's so funny. She's like the, the quintessential Gen Z, right? She's hilarious, but she admittedly, yeah, she's like an analytical buyer and you can see analytical buyers. Oftentimes they're very data oriented. The typical, like if you see an accountant, like analytical, I have a lot of accounting and financial advisor clients. They're all analytical and driver buyer, but yeah, analytical it's patience. And so I never gave up on Alyssa because and I have these conversations with clients all the time. They're like, oh my God, this client is not converting right away. And I'm like, do not slip into Desperado. And I'm like, let me, and I'm like, give me their page and I'll do a little deep dive. I'm like, screenshot your DMs. I'm like, girl, they're analytical. You got to take a breath. And say, <laughs> it's not about the time and kind of that bro marketing, get the sale right yeah. now, get it within the hour. You have to respect it's the love languages. You are going to suffocate her in the sales process and leave a bad taste in their mouth. And so that's analytical. My beloved amable buyers, those ones, they, they kill me. And yeah, and just like we poked fun at Alyssa when we were in the mini mine previously before the mastermind together, uh, we had Kelly and she is like quintessential amable. And again, similar to analytical, totally different energies. You have to be patient. So Amable, they love, they really love community. You're going to see them in group offerings, memberships. Kelly has a membership. It's so funny. Like you'll see them with that quote unquote sisterhood or just like true connections. They love to, they tend to have a little bit of not people pleasing, but they really do love to uplift the community and, and provide a great energy. They can be a hot mess express though. In the purchasing decision, the second they do trust you. And I say this all the time. It's like kindergarten with the rope when the teacher's walking. You can walk them to the checkout. You In sales psychology, you can disarm with humor. And for example, with my amable, I will make jokes. I'm like, girlfriend, oh, I'm catching the ghost right now. I know you're going to do a little ghosty ghost because we've been there. And they're like, oh, I was ghosting you. And they're like, what do I do? I'm like freaking out. I'm like, what's going on? What are these little babadooks in your mind? What do we got to work through? I'm here for you. And so amable they often, once they trust, they want to be told what to do because they are their worst critic. And so you just have to guide them and you have to create a safe space and open dialogue. And again, what I see in the sales, similar to analytical, people don't get it right away or they think, oh, I don't have time to convince this person. Don't look at it like that. Of course, if it goes on and on and you don't set proper boundaries or you don't have a structured sales flow, you don't want it to go on forever. But I've converted the hot mess express, I don't know, within two minutes because I just asked a simple question and I said, do this. And I was affirmative. I assumed the yes with them, another sales psych tactic. And then boom, they purchased. And then it was an amazing collaborative experience rather than an ego-filled experience in sales or you assumed that they just weren't interested. So that's amable. And then my favorite, I'm a driver buyer personally. 
And I often, my number one is expressive, but that's strategic, but I have a lot of driver buyers. So driver buyers are, they look for authority. They love to see you in your power and quote unquote, humble brags. They want to, and in the sale, selling process, the way you would treat an amable, you cannot treat a driver buyer. A driver buyer, it is a big sense of really want you to see their power and like fully trust them and say, I know you're going to make the best decision, like hands off, like you got it, girlfriend, go do it. Amable, they want you to be there with them, really nurture them. You have to see the power and validate the power of the driver buyer a lot of the times, or just again, trust that they're going to do the best thing. And they're the ones who they've done their research, but they have that gut feeling. They're like, Hey, I signed up, paid 20K, uh, 20K in full, or I'm, yep, I signed up. We're good to go. And they're like, sign, seal, deliver. It's a very quick conversion oftentimes because they are all already sure and they've done their homework behind the scenes. And so there's a lot of driver buyers in the space because entrepreneurs and driver buyers, again, they will not be shy to be open about their successes. They will, and yeah, and they'll really vocalize that to you. So yeah, those are the four buyer types, the little quick synopsis there of them. And they're, it's life-changing to tap into it. No, I love that so much. And I, I especially love thinking about like the analytical and the amiable because oftentimes when it comes to our marketing and even what I was taught, like in network marketing, where it's like, you have to push and push and push and push. And if they don't buy right then, then like you've lost it, you know, and that you have to get them to buy right then. And it's just like, that's just not how everyone is. And understanding that like different people purchase in different ways and they look at offers in different ways can change so many aspects aspects of business, not just like the conversations, but like the way that you market and all that good stuff, which is I, I'm assuming probably what you're going to dive into inside of your training when uh, we're at the summit, I'm guessing is probably more of like, yeah. the details of that approach there. Something else that I was thinking about too, as we were talking about your launch, as we're talking about different buyer types, you are the queen of selling on Instagram stories. And I don't tune into anyone's stories as much as I tune into yours, especially during your launch seasons. But being on your close friends list, I tune into it. I don't even know. It is like life or death if I don't watch those stories. <laughs> like the, it is like the best thing ever. And you're always the very first bubble on like my Instagram story feed. So with that being said, can you talk us through what is your thought process when it comes to posting on stories and like your approach to stories, your strategy to stories, which I know is all infused with sales psych too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it is the relationship building and the expressive buyers. I think, again, I keep saying, I think I know this because of experience of working with clients. People put so much pressure to be this professional business owner. And yes, you want to, right? Especially if you have the seven figure label or as you grow in scale and you want to shift perspectives and it depends on your goal. If you are like a brand and you don't want a, a strong personal brand, this might not be necessarily for you. But if you do, stories are so amazing to, to be like, it's not that deep. Like we can have fun. Um, and so with my stories, I really prioritize the shareholder effect. And again, I've seen this time and time again, where people want the engagement they want. The number one question I get asked is like, how do you not only create and such a, an engaged community towards you. It feels like your people are very tapped on. Like they remember things, they, yeah. they care, they reach out, but it's also communities are created within the community with myself. Yeah. So people will go collab, even in groups, like people have made merch together. They've started other businesses. Like it's, and even in the comments, they really follow each other. My affiliates say that often too. Oh, I've never seen sh such sheer power. Like I got this DM and it's, and you have a really like that is your impact as well too. And I've noticed that and people have noticed that and they've vocalized it to me. So very mutual with that. But on stories, I ask a lot of opinions and questions and I make it easy for people to engage. And I also show the engagement and not everything is like a prim and proper story. I always say this laughter is the backbone of my business. And so leading to a method with sales psych is the feel good factor. So I think this is something that I am if you want to say a hot take, it's not as much of a hot take, but I'm, I find the method that is really pushed or was really pushed in 2023 was agitation content, bringing mm -hmm. back the problem aware, poking at people's yep. 
through pain points. And that is so needed in marketing. There is no denying, I'm not knocking that, but there is again, a beautiful and nourishing and subtle way to go about it. And with my stories, I really don't conform to that. And a lot of my marketing, I don't conform to it. When I do it, it's still have it, it'll still have the feel good factor. So my stories are really about when you click it, you're either going to laugh, there's going to be some outrageous prank I'm pulling on my best friend, or it's going to be a lesson. It's going to be something inspiring. Um, and another quick method to give you, and this is something I always talk about is the sandwich method. So if I do share things, say money wins, which is controversial in itself, people think it can be a little tacky. Or if I'm sharing anything of substance that I want people to really marinate in and, and learn from it, I will deliver it through the sandwich method on my stories where I'll do a disclaimer, I'll get people ready, I'll, I'll give the mission or the why or the purpose behind it and set it up, set the tone, and then I'll deliver the punch and I'll be like, boom, this is the win or here's the lesson or here's the not so sexy news or here's whatever. And then I'll finish with a call to action and really something for people to take away, like a quick win. So if you're not laughing, you're getting something, you're feeling inspired or it's like a connection, uh, whether to me or the community. And so yeah, that was like a lot of things on the story, but it's, I also don't, I don't think so deep into it where I'm like, everything has to be planned 24 seven. If I'm in a launch, that's different. But on a day to day, I'm like, how can I make my people feel seen or connect? Or how can I laugh with them? It's a two way collab. That's no, I love that. And that creates an experience instead of it just being like me going into your stories, consuming your stories. Okay, cool. Let me move to the next story. It's that's why I want to tap into your stories because I feel like I'm experiencing something and it's because it is that two way that you were talking about where it's not just like you talking at me like over and over again. It's like, I have the opportunity to message you and then you might screenshot my message and then post it. And then someone else might respond to that with a different thought. And then you're screenshotting that. And it's, it's almost like a conversation, which is interesting because when it comes to Instagram in general, yeah, of course you have like your comment section and like direct messages where like conversation can happen, but like DMS, like that's private. And then the comment section, there's not really a lot of conversation that happens there. And so you have taken a place on Instagram where it's not normal for there to be like conversation and you've created conversation. And I think that's what creates the experience. I love that. That's actually such a great point. I've never thought about it like that. So thank you. And I think one quick tip too, that I noticed a lot of people do this and it's so freaking simple, but it is, it's rooted in psychology. Talk in first person. When you go in your stories, Mm -hmm. yes, you want to say y'all, you guys for certain pieces of context or marketing materials, but for the most part, talk in first person, talk like you're talking to one. And that is how you can make the masses. It feels more personable because we also just naturally, we are the main characters in our minds. So when we see that your brain, like you tap in just like even unintentionally, you tap in to it a little bit more. So that's a quick tip for you too, is start talking in first person. Oh, I love that. There's been so many little juicy words. Oh, and like this, and it's, you say it like so subtly, but actually it's so powerful. So I think you've mentioned that there's like 20 different things that you mentioned. So anyone listening, go back, re-listen, take notes. Anytime she's, oh, but like this, it's like, it's not actually, she's down, downplaying it. She, uh, it's actually very powerful. Now, the last thing that I want to ask you, Tosh, is... If you could go back to day one of your journey as an entrepreneur, what is one piece of advice you would give yourself? (sighs) One piece of advice I would give myself, not be scared. Don't be as scared of the next level. You got it. You got it. And that big, bold, audacious idea that you're thinking of, it's going to work out probably not the way you're envisioning right now, but it's for the better. And every, with that, every obstacle, or if you think major block or delay failure is literally setting you up for the utmost beautiful journey and things are going to transpire in ways that like you actually cannot even fathom. And for anyone listening, like if you're going through a little bit of a rut or you feel confused or you feel like things aren't meshing, this season of stillness or the season of feeling like crunchy, not comfortable, it's happening for a reason. And you have to know what dims your light in order to figure out what actually like really brightens it truly. And so cherish those moments and don't sit in the quote unquote rut. And really while you're thick in that, like you're just going through the motions, 
instead of afterwards being reflective in that moment, be like, okay, seriously, what can I learn from here? What is this telling me? Um, Because it's like that saying, if you're going to fail fast and I don't see failure as failure, it's the best opportunity to grow. So that was a little bit of a few points, but I would definitely say that because let's be real, everyone listening, we all know entrepreneurship is such a freaking ride. Like in one hour, you can be happy, go lucky, having the most amazing time. And then the next hour you're crying and you want to burn your business to the ground. So having that sense of, okay, she's grounded. I can like really work through anything is going to be like your North Star. I love that. That is the most accurate thing I've ever heard in my entire life. So true. Okay. Where can people find you? I already know. I already know people want to connect with you more. Where can they connect with you more? Yeah, you can find me on Instagram at natasha.zorik. And then if you want to check out Azura, we are on Instagram, we are Azura. So you can find me there. I have my own podcast too, Tash Talks. We've taken a little bit of a break, but I'm going to definitely pick up on that again. But yeah, that's where you can find me. I have my website. I'm sure that'll be in the show notes. And if you want to reach out, DM me, please. I love to connect in the DMs if you didn't get that vibe from the podcast. So feel free. So yeah, awesome. that's where you can I am so excited again for the opportunity that we have to meet in person. And if any of you listening also want to come learn with us and vibe with us and get become besties, um, we are hopefully all going to be there um, in October. Every single person listening, please come. It's going to be an absolute blast. But thank you so much, Tosh, for your time, for sharing all about Sales Psych. And I just appreciate you and love you so much. Thank you so much. And thanks for everyone listening.